بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم in the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful i testify that there is no true god worthy of worship except Allah that Muhammad is Allah's true slave and messenger we begin tonight the explanation from riyadh salihin for the first hadith and the under the chapter of ikhlas of sincerity and this hadith is the famous hadith of umar ibn al-khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said wa an amir al-mu'minin abi hafs umar ibn al-khattab bin nufail bin abdul uzza bin riyah bin abdullah bin qurt bin razah bin adi bin ka'b bin luay bin ghalib al-qurashi العدوي رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه متفق على صحته The translation of the meaning. Actions, this is the, on the authority of <coughs> Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the believers, who the faithful, Abu Hafs, Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that I heard the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, actions are but by intention, and every man shall have but that which he intended. So whoever migrated for Allah and his messenger, his migration will be for Allah and his messenger. And whoever immigrated for worldly benefits or for a woman to marry, his immigration would be for that which he migrated for. The explanation. Since this is a chapter on sincerity, sincerity of intention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that this must be regarding every saying and in every action and in all our affairs. So the author, rahimahullah, mention the <coughs> the verses from the Quran which are related to this subject and then he began with the hadith and the first hadith which he listed was this hadith by Umar إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ by Umar ibn Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه actions are but by intentions and every man shall have but that which he intended some of the ulama said that these are these two statements إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are but by intentions and وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئِ مَّا نَوَى And every man shall have but that which he intended They said these are two statements having one meaning and that the second statement which is every man shall have but that which he intended is an affirmation of the first statement which is actions are but by intentions however this is incorrect why because the origin of the speech is that it is of the establishing nature not the assertion nature or not the assertative, assertative, assertative nature and also furthermore, upon contemplation it becomes clear that there are a great there is a great difference between these two statements. The first one is a cause. Actions are but by intentions. And the second is an outcome. The first is a cause. The Prophet ﷺ makes it clear. That أن كل عمل لا بد فيه من نية. That every action must have an intention. So any action done by man while he is sane and by his will, then it requires intention. And no one who is sane and willingly does whatever he wants to do, except that he does it with an intention. 
or had a sahih, this is correct. How can one do certain things without intentions? This is impossible. Because the action arouses from a determination. Because the action arouses from a determination and ability. And the determination is the intention. And the determination is the intention. So therefore, the first statement, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are but by intentions, or deeds are considered by the intentions, means that everyone who does anything, then he requires an intention for that thing that he wants to do. However, the intentions vary to a great extent between people. People's intentions vary. Some of them, their intentions aim high to most lofty places. And then, on the other hand, there are people whose intentions are base, despicable, garbage. So therefore, you can meet two people doing the same action, agreeing in it regarding its beginning and through it and finishing it in, in, in sayings, in actions, in movements, etc. Yet there is a great difference between them. And this is what? The due to what? The due to the difference in the intentions. And as an outcome, the second statement comes. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى فَكُلُّ امْرِئٍ لَهُ مَا نَوَى And a person will get the reward according to his intention. Or every man shall have but that which he intended. If he intends Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if he intends Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the hereafter, in his legal actions, then he will attain that. And if he intends this dunya, this life, he may attain, and he may not attain it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Isra, in chapter 17, verse 18, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعَاجِلَةَ عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءُ لِمَنْ نُرِيد Whoever wishes for the quick passing, the transitory enjoyment of this world, we readily grant him what we will for whom we like. Allah didn't say that we readily grant him what he wants, we readily grant him what we will for whom we like. Then afterwards we have appointed for him hell. He will burn therein disgraced and rejected. Far away from Allah's mercy. So there are from mankind those who are given whatever they wish from this life. And some are given part of what they wish. And some who are given nothing. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we readily grant him, what means, what we will for whom we like. Compare this in the same surah, chapter 17, verse 19. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا And whoever desires the hereafter and strives for it, with the necessary effort to do for it, being righteous and doing good deeds, while he is a believer in Tawheed, then such are the ones whose striving will be appreciated, thanked and rewarded by Allah. And therefore now we know, إِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Every man shall have but that which he intended. These 
statement innamal a'malu bin niyat verily actions are but by intentions this is the scale of the inward this is the scale of the inward what about the scale of the outward this came in the other hadith reported by Aisha and it is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim من عمل عملا ليس عليه أمرنا فهو رد whoever does an action which is not in accordance with our matter meaning our deen, our way فهو رد then it will be rejected this is the scale of the apparent and this hadith which we are talking about إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ verily in actions are but by intentions this is the scale of the inward that's why the people of knowledge said هذان الحديثان يجمعان الدين كله these two hadiths comprise the entire deen comprise the entire deen the hadith of Umar which we are talking about إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ actions are but by intentions which is the scale of the inward and the hadith of Aisha may Allah be pleased with all of them whoever does an action which is not in accordance with our way will have it rejected this is the scale of the apparent actions then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set a similitude as an application for the meaning of this hadith he said فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ so thus who he whose migration was for Allah and his messenger فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ His migration then was for Allah and His Messenger. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ And he whose migration was to achieve some worldly benefits or to take some woman in marriage, his migration was for that for which he migrated. Migration. What does it mean? Hijrah. It means that a person moves from the land of Kufr to the land of Islam. For example, a person in the States, and the States is a land of Kufr, he becomes a Muslim, and he is unable to practice his deen openly, then he moves from that state to the land of Islam. This is the meaning of Hijrah. This is the meaning of Hijrah. And people differ regarding the Hijrah. Some of them make Hijrah, migrate, and leave their country for Allah and His Messenger meaning for the Sharia of Allah, which Allah legislated on the tongue of His Messenger. And this is the one who intends the good and will attain it, will attain the objective. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then His migration was for Allah and His Messenger. Meaning He achieves what He intended. The second time, those who migrate for this worldly life, someone who loves to accumulate wealth. So he hears that in the land of Islam there is great opportunity to accumulate wealth. 
So he emigrates from the land of Kufr to the land of Islam only for the sake of wealth. Not to, not intending to straight his deen, his practice, and he does not care for his deen, his highest objective is al-mal, wealth. This is the second type. A third type is a man who immigrates from the land of Kufr to the land of Islam intending to marry a woman. He is told, we are not going to marry you except when you immigrate to us and that you don't take her to the land of Kufr. So he immigrates from the land of Kufr to the land of Islam for the sake of marrying this woman. So the one who seeks the worldly benefits and the one who seeks to marry a woman in fact he did not or he is not migrating for Allah and his messenger and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ his migration was for that which he migrated Why he didn't say the Prophet ﷺ his migration will be for the dunya, for this lofty life and for the woman? Because these are goals that are despicable. Because immigration is one of the great deeds. Having it for this lowly desire, that's why the Prophet ﷺ did not mention that at the end of this statement when he said, his migration was for that for which he migrated. He didn't say his migration was for this life and for this woman. No. He didn't mention that. Now, what are the types of hijra? The types of hijra are three. Hijra could be for, could be related to deeds. Number one, and it could relate to the doer of deeds, and it could relate to the place. So these are three things, deeds, doer, and place. Deeds, doer, and place. The first time emigrating from the place. Here, a person leaves a place where there is a lot of sin and wickedness. And it could be a land of kufr. He emigrates to a place where these things are not present. And the greatest of such migration is from the migra- is the one from the land of Kufr to the land of Islam. And Ahlul Ilm and the people of knowledge said that it is incumbent on the person to migrate from the land of Kufr to the land of Islam if he is unable to make his deen manifested. However, if he is able to make his deen manifested and is not opposed if he establishes the Islamic code, then in this case migration is not incumbent upon him, rather it is recommendable. And therefore, if a person is a land of kufr, his home country, if he is unable to establish his deen in that land, then it is incumbent upon him to migrate. Similarly, if the person is from the Islam, from the people, a Muslim, and from the land of Islam, then it is not permissible for him to travel to the land of Kufr because this will constitute a danger on his deen and on his character and also it could be a waste of wealth and also it could be 
a type of support to the economy of the land of Kufr. And we are commanded, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear, and this is when we have the ability, of course, as in Surah At-Tawbah, 9, 123. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يَلُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ وَلْيَجِدُوا فِيكُمْ غِلْضَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Oh, you believe, find those of the disbelievers who are close to you and let them find harshness in you and know that Allah is with those who are the muttaqeen. And this is in the case where we have the ability and we have the strength and we have the power. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the same verse in mine 120, وَلَا يَطَعُونَ مَوْطِئًا يُغِيضُ الْكُفَّارَ وَلَا يَنَلُونَ مِنْ عَدُوٍ نَيْلًا إِلَّا كُتِبَ لَهُمْ بِهِ عَمَلٌ صَالِحٍ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِعُ عَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ It was not becoming of the people of the Medina and of the of the neighborhood to remain behind Allah's Messenger and uh, to prefer their own lives to his life that is because they suffer neither thirst nor fatigue nor hunger in the cause of Allah nor they take any step to raise the anger of the disbelievers nor inflict any injury upon an enemy but is written to their credit as the deed of righteousness surely Allah wastes not the reward of the mushriks the kafir whoever is he whether he is from the Christians or the Jews or otherwise from the disbelievers and whether he carries the name of Islam or not claims to be a Muslim or not if in reality he is a Kafir then the Kafir is an enemy to Allah and to his book and to the messenger and to the all the believers And therefore, it is not permissible for a person to travel to the land of Kufr except with three conditions. Except with three conditions. First, that he has knowledge to ward off misconceptions. Because the Kafirs could bring forth many misconceptions about Islam and about the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and about the book and also concerning even their characters make it seem fair to the muslims and something to look for so they can bring any types of misconceptions so that the person stays in doubt reluctant unsteady regarding his deen and it's known, now it's known that if the person has doubt in matters where certainty is required then in this case he did not or he is not able to establish what is required from him so the belief in Allah and His books and the angels and the messengers and the last day and the pre-decree, it's good and it's bad. The belief in all of that must be with certainty. And if the person doubts any one of this, then he becomes a kafir. So the kafirs will bring forth many of these misconceptions to the Muslim. Even to the extent that one of their leaders mentioned that do not attempt to take the Muslim from his deen to Christianity. It is sufficient that you cast doubt regarding his deen. Because if you do so, then you take away the deen from him. And this is sufficient. And if you attempt to make him enter the fold of Christianity which is based upon misguidance and foolishness then this is not possible because the Christians are misguided
as came in the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Although the deen of Isa alayhi salam is a deen of truth, but it is the deen of the truth in the time of Isa alayhi salam. Before it was abrogated afterwards by the message of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And therefore guidance and the truth is with the final message. The second condition that he should have established deen that protects him from lowly desires. This is the second condition. In order to repel, to ward off the lowly desires. So the one who travels to these lands, he may get submerged seeing all these beautifications of the dunya, of this lowly life, and the lust alcohol, intoxications, fornications, adultery, and homosexuality, all forms of evil present. And therefore, it is dangerous that he may fall in the mud of lust unless he has an established deen to protect him. The third condition, that there is a need for him to go. Like for example, ill, seeking travel to find a place where he can go for a cure. Or for medication. Or he may need a certain knowledge not present in the land of Islam, a specialty, a specialization. Then in this case he may travel and learn, or he may need to go for a trade or a commerce. So he goes, finishes his business and returns. Therefore, it's a must that there is a need, and therefore, and therefore I see that the Shaykh Rahimahullah said those who travel to the land of Kufr only for the sake of tourism I see that they are sinful and that every every coin every penny every you name it that they spend in this travel then this is unlawful and waste and they will be asked about that on the day of resurrection uh, where they are not going to find there on the day of resurrection places where they can do for tourism they will find there only their deeds because these people are wasting their times and their monies and they are corrupting their characters also sometimes they may have with them their families and it's amazing that these people travel to the land of Kufr where there is no adhan to be heard and no remembrances only to hear the bells and of the Christians and, uh, and those are and then they stay there for, for, for some time with their families and their children their, boys and girls and this, there is a great evil in that we see refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and safety and these are from the types which brings upon us calamities yes and calamities which we are living nowadays all because of our sins and disobedience as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah al-Shura, in chapter 42, verse 30, Allah ta'ala, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ We are heedless. 
as if we are safe in our lands, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he forgot about us, as if he doesn't know. But if the hearts had become tough, and harsh. Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al-Mumin Yes, and whatever of misfortune befalls you, it is because of what your hands have earned, and he pardons much. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said in Surah Al-Mu'minun in 23, verse 76, And indeed we seized them with punishment, but they humbled not themselves to their Lord, nor did they invoke Allah with submission to him. The hearts became harsh. We seek refuge in Allah from this. And it became also dead. To the extent that all these calamities befalling us passes on the hearts as if just like cold water. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the death of the heart and from its harshness. Had people, had they been thinking about this, had our hearts been lively, then our situation would not have been like it is nowadays. And we see this happening, and all these calamities around us, and destructive wars and everything, and yet you find people taking their families and they go for tourism in the land of kufr and the land of disobedience. We seek refuge in Allah from this. Now, traveling to the land of kufr for da'wah is permissible if the person is effective. And there is an effect for the da'wah. Because in this case, this is a travel for a benefit. And in the land of Kufr, many of the common people there are blind regarding Islam. They don't know much about Islam. Rather, they had been misguided. And they are told that Islam is a vicious, barbaric religion, especially when the West hears of these actions which are carried on the hands of those who say that we are Muslims. So they will say, where is Islam? What is Islam? This is Barbarism, beasts, transgressing, transgressing against each other. So people will turn away from Islam because of the actions of the Muslims. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all to his straight path. The second type of hijrah is the hijrah regarding the deeds. And this is for the person to abandon the sins and the acts of disobedience which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade him to do. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, المسلم من سلم المسلمون من لسانه ويده والمهاجر من هجر ما نهى الله عنه A Muslim is the one who avoids harming Muslims with his tongue and his hands. And a Muhajir, the immigrant, is the one who gives up, abandons all that 
which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 8. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 8, hadith number 491. So the person gives up and abandons every unlawful thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made unlawful. Whether this relates to the rights of Allah or relates to the rights of the slaves. So the person gives up insults, bad words, killing, cheating, taking people's wealth wrongly, being bad to parents, severing the relation of kins, and everything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared as unlawful, then the person should give up and abandon. Even if one's self calls him to do that and insist upon him, then he should remember that Allah forbade that so that he can relinquish and abandon and stay away from. The third type, the third type, is giving up or abandoning the doer because sometimes the doer is to be abandoned the people of knowledge said like the person who openly he openly practices the sin and who does not mind it then it is legal to abandon him if there is a benefit in such abandonment. And this means that if he is abandoned, then he will come to realize his own doing and then will refrain from the sin. For example, a person well known in cheating in his trade so people abandon him and if they do and he repents from this and then regrets then alhamdulillah the benefit is there another person who deals with riba with usury and people abandon him and they don't give him salam and then talk to him and if he knows this then he will feel ashamed of himself and then he will return to his senses and repent a third one and this is the worse he does not pray then this is an apostate kafir must be abandoned And the salam is not to return, to be returned to him. And not to be also offered the salam, greeted with the salam. And if he invites you, then his invitation is not to be considered. Until he comes to know of himself and returns to Allah and returns to Islam. And this will be the benefit for him. However, if the abandonment is not beneficial and is of no benefit and it is because it's due to a sin, not because of a person's cough, because the abandonment on kufr is required. And the kafir who is upstate is to be under abandonment under all conditions, whether there is a benefit or not. However, we're talking about now the person who commits sins that are not of the kufr type. Then in this case, if the abandonment is is of of, of no benefit, it's not anticipated to be beneficial, then it is not permissible to abandon him. 
because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا يحل لمسلم أن يهجر أخاه فوق سلاء في ليال يلتقيان فيعرض هذا ويعرض هذا وخيرهما الذي يبدأ السلام أو الذي يبدأ بالسلام in the hadith reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim the Prophet ﷺ said it is not lawful for a man to desert his brother Muslim for more than three nights it is unlawful for them if they meet one of them turns his face away from the other and the other turns his face from the former and it is known that the sins which are lesser in degree than kufr with Ahl Sunnah it does not take the person out of the fold of Islam then afterwards we look is the deserting beneficial or not if it is and it will lead the person to know of his sin and therefore abandon it and relinquish it then in this case he is to be deserted and the evidence for this is in the story of Ka'b ibn Malik may Allah be pleased with him and Hilal ibn Umayyah al-Waqifi and Murara bin al-Rabi' al-Amri may Allah be pleased with them who remained behind the sharing or sharing in the conquest of Tabuk so the Prophet ﷺ hajarahum, abandoned them and their story is in Al-Bukhari and a Muslim and we will go over it now Ka'ab bin Malik may Allah be pleased with him narrated that I did not remain behind Allah's messenger in any ghazwa, in any expedition that he fought except the expedition of Tabuk and I failed to take part in the expedition of Badr but Allah did not admonish anyone who had not participated in it for in fact Allah's messenger وسلم, had gone out in search of the caravan of Quraysh till Allah made them the Muslims and their enemy meet without any appointment I witnessed the night of Al-Aqaba the pledge with Allah's messenger when we pledged for Islam and I would not exchange it for the, bat- for the better battle although the better battle is more popular amongst the people than, it, than the pledge battle as for my news in the battle of Tabuk I had never been stronger or wealthier than I was when I remained behind the Prophet ﷺ in that expedition by Allah never had I two she camels before but I had then at the time of this expedition whenever Allah's messenger wanted to make Ghazwa expedition he used to hide his intention by apparently referring to different expedition till it was the time of that expedition of Tabuk which Allah's messenger وسلم, fought in severe heat facing a long journey desert and the great number of enemy so the Prophet وسلم, announced to the Muslims clearly their destination so that they might get prepared for their expedition so he informed them clearly of the destination he was going to Allah's Messenger وسلم, was accompanied by a large number of Muslims who could not be listed in a book namely a, ris- a register Ka'b added any man who intended to be absent would think that the matter would remain hidden unless Allah revealed it through divine revelation so Allah's Messenger fought that expedition at the time when the fruits had ripened and the shade looked pleasant Allah's Messenger وسلم, and his companions prepared for the battle and I started to go out in order to get myself ready along with them but I returned without doing anything I would say to myself I can do that so I kept on delaying it every now and then till the people got ready and Allah's Messenger وسلم, and the Muslims along with him departed and I had not prepared anything for my departure and I said I will prepare myself for departure one or two days after him and then join them in the morning following their departure I went out to get myself ready but returned having done nothing 
Then again in the next morning I went out to get ready but returned without doing anything. Such was the case with me till they hurried away and the battle was missed by me. Even then I intended to depart to take them over. I wish I had done so, but it was not in my luck. So after the departure of Allah's Messenger وسلم, whenever I went out and walked amongst the people, meaning the remaining persons, it grieved me that I could see none around me but one accused of hypocrisy or one of those weak men whom Allah had excused. Allah's Messenger وسلم, did not remember me till he reached Tabuk. So he so while he was sitting amongst the people in Tabuk he said, What did Kaab do? A man from Banu Sulayma or Bani, Sal- Bani Salima Bani Salama Bani Salama said O oh Allah's messenger he was being stopped or he has been stopped by his two burda meaning two garments and his looking at his own flanks with pride then Mu'adh bin Jabal said what a bad thing you have said by Allah O oh Allah's messenger we know nothing about him but good. Allah and Messenger وسلم, kept silent. Ka'ab bin Malik added, When I heard that he, meaning the Prophet وسلم, was on his way back to al Medina, I got dipped in my concern and began to think of false excuses, saying to myself, saying to myself, How can I avoid this anger tomorrow? And I took the advice of wise member of my family in this matter. When it was said that Allah's Messenger had approached al Medina, all the evil false excuses abandoned from my mind. And I knew well that I could never come out of this problem by forging a false statement. Then I decided firmly to speak the truth. So Allah's Messenger وسلم, arrived in the morning. And whenever he returned from a journey, he used to visit the mosque first of all and offer a two rak'ah prayer therein and then sit for the people. So when he had done all that this time, those who had failed to join the battle of Tabuk came and started offering false excuses and taking oaths before him. There were something over 80 men. Allah's Messenger وسلم, accepted the excuses they had expressed took their pledge, asked for Allah's forgiveness for them, and left the secrets of their hearts for Allah to judge. Then I came to him, and when I greeted him, he smiled a smile of an angry person, and then said, Come on. So I came walking, till I sat before him. He said to me, What stopped you from joining us? Had you not purchased an animal for carrying you? I answered, Yes, O Allah's Messenger. But by Allah, if I were sitting before any person from among the people of the world other than you, I would have avoided his anger with an excuse. By Allah, I have been bestowed with the power of speaking fluently and eloquently. But by Allah, I knew well that if today I tell you a lie to seek your favor, Allah would surely make you angry with me in the near future. But if I tell you the truth, though you will get angry because of it, I hope for Allah's forgiveness. Really, by Allah, there was no excuse for me. By Allah, I had never been stronger or wealthier than I was when I remained behind you. Then Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, As regards this man, he has surely told the truth, so get up till Allah decides your case. I got up, and many men of Banu Salama followed me and said to me, by Allah, we never witnessed you doing any sin before this. Surely you failed to offer excuse to Allah's Messenger وسلم, as the others who did not join him have offered. The invocation of Allah's Messenger وسلم, to Allah to forgive you would have been sufficient for you. By Allah, they continued blaming me so much that I intended to return to the Prophet وسلم, and accuse myself of having told a lie. But I said to myself, is there anybody else who has met the same fate as I have? They replied, yes, there are two men 
who have said the same thing as you have and to both of them was given the same order as given to you I said who are they they replied Murara Murara ibn Rabi' Al-Amri and Hilal bin Umayyah Al-Waqifi by that they mentioned to me two pious men who had attended the expedition of Badr and in whom there was an example for me so I did not change my mind when they mentioned them to me Allah's Messenger forbade all the Muslims to talk to us the three aforesaid persons out of all those who had remained behind in that expedition so we kept away from the people and they changed their attitude towards us till the very land where I lived appeared strange to me as if I did not know it we remained in that condition for 50 nights as regards my two fellows they remained in their houses and kept on weeping but I was the youngest of them and the firmest of them so I used to go out and witness the Salah the prayers along with the Muslims and roam about in the markets but none would talk to me and I would come to Allah's Messenger وسلم, and greet him while he was sitting in his gathering after the Salah and I would wonder whether the Prophet وسلم, did move his lips in return to my greetings or not then I would offer my Salah prayer near to him and look at him stealthily when I was busy with my Salah he would turn his face towards me but when I turned my face to him he would turn his face away from me when this harsh attitude of the people lasted long I walked till I scaled till I scaled the wall of the garden of Abu Qatada who was my cousin and dearest person to me and I offered my greetings to him by Allah he did not return my greetings I said O oh, Abu Qatada I beseech you by Allah do you know that I love Allah and his messenger وسلم, he kept quiet I asked him again beseeching him by Allah but he remained silent then I asked him again in the name of Allah he said Allah and his messenger know it better thereupon my eyes flowed with tears and I returned and jumped over the wall Kaab added while I was walking in the market of Al Medina suddenly I saw a Christian farmer from the Anbat of Asham, Greater Syria who came to sell his grains in Al Medina saying who will lead me to Kaab bin Malik the people began to point me out for him till he came to me and handed me a letter from the king of Ghassan the Christians in which the following was written quote to proceed I have been informed that your friend, meaning the Prophet وسلم, has treated you harshly. Anyhow, Allah does not let you live at a place where you feel inferior and your right is lost. So join us and we will console you. When I read it, I said to myself, this is also a sort of test. Then I took the letter to the oven and made a fire therein by burning it. When forty out of the fifty nights elapsed, behold, there came to me the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam orders you to keep away from your wife. I said, should I divorce her or else what should I do? He said, no, only keep aloof from her and do not cohabit her. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent the same message to my two fellows then I said to my wife go to your parents and remain with them till Allah gives his verdict in this matter Kaab added the wife of Hilal bin Umayyah came to Allah's messenger and said O oh Allah's messenger Hilal bin Umayyah is a helpless old man who has no servant to attend on him do you dislike that I should serve him he said, no, you can serve him, but he should not come near you. She said, by Allah, he has no desire for anything. By Allah, he has never ceased weeping till his case began till this day of his. On that, 
some of my family members said to me, will you also ask Allah's messenger to permit your wife to serve you as she has permitted the wife of Hilal bin Umayyah to serve him? I said, by Allah, I will not ask the permission of Allah's messenger regarding her, for I don't know what Allah's messenger would say if I asked him to permit her to serve me while I am a young man. Then I remained in that state for 10 more nights after that, Till the period of 50 nights was completed, starting from the time when Allah's Messenger prohibited the people from talking to us. When I had offered the Fajr prayer on the 50th morning on the roof of one of our houses, and while I was sitting in the condition which Allah described in the Quran, that is, my very soul seemed straightened to me, and even the earth seemed narrow to me for all its spaciousness, spaciousness there there I heard the voice of one who had ascended the mountain of Sal of Sala calling with the loudest voice O Ka'ab bin Malik be happy by receiving good tidings I fell down in prostration before Allah realizing that relief has come Allah's Messenger وسلم, had announced the acceptance of our repentance by Allah when he had offered the Fajr prayer. The people then went out to congratulate us. Some bringers of good tidings went out to my two fellows and a horseman came to me in haste and a man of Banu Aslam came running and ascended the mountain and his voice was swifter than the horse. When he, the man whose voice I had heard, came to me conveying the good tidings, I took off my garments and dressed him with them and by Allah I owned no other garments than them on that day then I borrowed two garments and wore them and went to Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the people started receiving me in batches congratulating me on Allah's acceptance of my repentance saying we congratulate you on Allah's acceptance of your repentance Kaab further said when I entered the mosque I saw Allah's messenger sitting with the people around him Talha ibn Ubaidullah swiftly came to me, shook hands with me, and congratulated me. By Allah, none of the Muhajireen, the immigrants, got up for me except him, Talha, and I will never forget this for Talha. Kaab added, when I greeted Allah's Messenger, وسلم, he, his face being bright with joy, said, Be happy with the best day that you have got ever since your mother delivered you. Kaab added, I said to the Prophet وسلم, is this forgiveness from you or from Allah? He said, no, it is from Allah. Whenever Allah's Messenger وسلم, became happy, his face would shine as if it were a piece of the moon. And we, will, and we all knew that characteristic of him. When I sat before him, I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, because of the acceptance of my repentance, I will give up all my wealth as alms for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Keep some of your wealth as it will be better for you. I said, So I will keep my share from Khaybar with me. And added, O oh Allah's Messenger, Allah has saved me from, for telling the truth. So it is a part of my repentance not to tell but the truth as long as I am alive. By Allah, I don't know anyone of the Muslims whom Allah has helped for telling the truth more than me. Since I have mentioned that truth to Allah's Messenger وسلم, I have never intended to tell a lie ever since. I said that to Allah's Messenger وسلم, till today. I hope that Allah will also save me from telling lies the rest of my life. So Allah revealed to His Messenger وسلم, the verse لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ إِلَىٰ قَوْلِهِ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Allah has forgiven the Prophet, the Muhajirs, the immigrants, and the Ansar, the supporters, and be with those who are true in words and deeds. By Allah, Allah has never bestowed upon me, apart from His guiding me to Islam, a greater blessing than the fact that I did not tell a lie to Allah's Messenger وسلم, which would have caused me to perish as those who have told a lie perished for Allah described those who told lies with the worst description he ever attributed to anybody else Allah said 
سيحلفون بالله لكم إذا انقلبتم إلى قوله فإن الله لا يرضى عن القوم الفاسقين they, the hypocrites will swear by Allah to you Muslims when you return to them up to his saying certainly Allah is not pleased with the people who are rebellious disobedient to Allah Kaab added we the three persons differed altogether from those whose excuses Allah's Messenger وسلم, accepted when they swore to him. He took their pledge and asked Allah to forgive them, but Allah's Messenger left our case pending till Allah gave his judgment about it. As for that, Allah said, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا As for that, Allah said, and he did forgive also the three who remained behind. What Allah said in this verse does not indicate our failure to take part in the expedition, but it refers to the deferment of making a decision by the Prophet ﷺ about our case in contrast to the case of those who had taken an oath before him and he excused them by accepting their excuses. This is in its detail, you can find it in volume 5 and hadith number 702 of Sahih al-Bukhari. These are the types of hijra, the hijra of the place, the hijra of al-amal, of the action, and the hijra of the doer. And this brings the end of the explanation of this great hadith. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.